This is uh, Reverend Mark Peter. So Pastor Mark, he is our district superintendent. So in the Alliance, yes, yes. It's a, uh, it is a quick review, it's not gonna be long. Quick review, in the Alliance we have six districts across Canada. One of the districts is British Columbia and Yukon is called Canadian Pacific District. I call it the beautiful British Columbia and Yukon district. So uh, he is the, uh, the head of this district. And uh, so every Sunday you do see a representative of him here. Although this is, uh, he's, he's not here all the time. But as a licensed worker of the CN CNMA, I am a representative, and so is Pastor Ben, a licensed worker, of our district superintendent. So just to let you know that. And I want to introduce him to you at this moment. And uh, so yeah, Pastor Mark has served with the CNMA for the last 25 years. Well, can you get that, that globe uh, service? I got one too for 15 years, so that's cool. Okay, so he was a pastor at First Alliance Church, uh, First Alliance in Calgary for nine years. He served as the lead pastor at North Shore Alliance Church for 13 years, just right across the street. And uh, we moved into this place in 2006. So uh, you can imagine that. Uh, that was a long time ago for 13 years for him also. Mark has been married to Naomi for nearly 25 years in January 2024. So happy anniversary. Yeah, he has a young adult son, uh, Luke, and his daughter Anna will be graduating from high school in June. And when Mark isn't, when Pastor Mark isn't working or spending time, spending money, Spending time with his family, he loves to run, Ooh, nice. go, yes, and Amen. with uh, woodwork, woodwork. So, uh, please join me as I pray for him as uh, he brings the word of God to us. Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for your presence now. Lord, we trust in your word that says it will not go back to you void of its purpose that you will use your servant. Thank you, Lord, for bringing uh, Pastor Mark here today. It is not by accident why he is here at this uh, moment in this Sunday. Thank you, Lord, anoint him a double portion of your blessings and use him mightily, even beyond what he could imagine, Lord. Uh, beyond his uh, abilities, beyond his imag imagination, use him for your glory and honor today to bring us closer to Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessings. Thank you, brother. Well, it's so wonderful to be with you this morning. I, I was saying to Pastor Cress that I pastored across the street for 13 years, and I was always there, so I could, I could never be here. But I thought of you and prayed for you many, many times. And so what a treat to be here. And I also have the privilege, I think Dylan and, and Pastor Ben, we're going to the Surrey the Surrey Church later on this afternoon, so I'll have a chance to be there. I was at the back before the service started, and someone came up to me and said, you're the district superintendent, you look so young. <laughs> I don't know at what point I get to be old, but I just turned 50 in, uh, in June, so on the inside, sometimes I feel very old. But it is such a privilege to serve as the district superintendent for churches across BC. Uh, it, it means that I get to travel across our province, I get to connect with pastors and elders boards and congregations, and everywhere I go, whether I'm in the city or I'm in a rural setting, whether I'm in a really large church or a really small church, the common denominator is everywhere I go, I encounter the presence of Jesus in the midst of his people. And so I am so grateful to be here today, so grateful to the team for leading us in worship, or once again, we encounter the living presence of, of Christ. This morning, I'm going to be preaching from Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. But before I get into the text, I want to take just a few moments to outline for you the subject of my sermon, namely the heart. So unless you're here today and you work in the medical field or unless you find yourself being a cardiac patient, it's likely that you spend very little 
time thinking about your own heart. The average human heart could fit in the palm of a hand and it does more work than any other muscle in the entire body throughout the course of your lifetime. Did you know that the human heart starts beating only four weeks after conception? Just four weeks. Did you know that in the average human lifetime, a heart will beat 2.5 billion times? It's astounding. Did you know that the human heart, over the course of a lifetime, will pump up to 1 million barrels of blood, which is enough to fill three super tankers that we see down in, in the West Vancouver Harbor? We know so much more about the physiology of the human heart than the ancient scripture writers knew. And yet there are many things that the, our ancient fathers and mothers knew about the heart that it seems as though people in our day and time have forgotten. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, we read, The Lord does not look at things that people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, King Solomon wrote, Above all else, guard your heart, because everything you do flows from it. And in Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It was Jesus' way of saying that the words we speak reveal what's in our heart. Our actions and behavior reveals what's in our heart. Our pursuits in life always reveal what's in our heart. And the promise Jesus gave to his followers is what's inside of you is always going to come out for the world to see. Statistics Canada tells us that heart disease is the second leading cause of death in our nation. And I think the, what the Bible would tell us is that a diseased heart is the single leading cause of fruitlessness. And so, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus told one of his famous stories. And the story describes the kind of work that he was doing during his earthly ministry. Jesus was like a farmer going out into the field and scattering seed everywhere he went. The seed is God's word. The soil is the human heart. In farming, some soil is more fertile than others. So too, the human heart, Jesus said. And so as we turn our attention now to the text, I invite you to lift up your heart to the Lord and to his word. So reading now from Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, Jesus called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. Jesus said, the knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see, Though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. And those along the path are ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So Luke is 
this gospel writer, and he's taken this parable of Jesus, and he's deliberately placed it in where it stands in the larger gospel narrative. In the surrounding chapters of Luke, we see Jesus scattering seed wherever he goes, through his preaching, through his miracles, and the response of the crowd to Jesus reveals the condition of their heart. At times, hard, at times, fragile or thorn infested, but we also discover along the way fertile soil or receptive hearts. These are those people that listen to what Jesus say and respond, and we discover fertile soil among unlikely people. A sinful woman, a cheating tax collector, a Roman centurion, these are the people who orient to Jesus, they receive what he say, says, and their lives bear fruit. And so what I want to do with you this morning is I want to walk through each of the four different heart responses to Jesus, and as I do, allow these categories to be a kind of mirror for each of you. At the end of the day, we want Jesus to reveal to us what's the condition of our own hearts to his word. And so in verses 5 and 12, Jesus addresses the hard heart. These are people who hear the word of Jesus, but they ultimately refuse to listen. John 10.10 10 tells us that while Jesus has come to bring everyone abundant life, the devil is hard at work to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the question for all of us related to the text is, how does the devil steal the words that Jesus wants to plant in our lives? Let me give you an example. I want to suggest to you that the devil's voice is so subtle, at times when you hear it, you would swear you were listening to your own voice. And so, for example, when Jesus invites you day by day or Sunday after Sunday to receive the love of the Father and the subsequent thought comes to your own mind, I'm not good enough. God would never accept me. He's not going to forgive me, not after what I've done, not after I've done it multiple times. It sounds like your own voice, but I want to suggest that it's the devil at work trying to steal God's words before it can plant seeds of God's love in you. Think for a moment about the farmer in the parable and how he goes about scattering seed. Is it just me, or does the farmer seem to be a little reckless? Because only a fool or a person with unlimited supply of seed would scatter it on trampled down paths. It's too much of a long shot. It's got almost no chance to grow. But Jesus, in his parable, is telling us something important about himself. Jesus can see what no one else can. He can see a, a willing heart in what you and I might consider to be an unlikely person. Now, if you look back at Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we have this um, brief description that actually tells us something very important about the kind of God that Jesus is. So we read Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with them, and also some women. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So when Jesus first called disciples to himself, there was this collection, this odd collection of people who came. There were fishermen, there were religious zealots, there were tax collectors, and alongside this motley crew, there were women. Now Jesus was born at a time that was dominated by patriarchy. And what I mean by that is in the ancient world, women were minimally educated and given extremely low freedom. And ancient philosophers, such as Aristotle, spoke what was the general sentiment of the day, namely that women were inferior to men intellectually, physically, and morally. That's how people thought. But in the Gospels, again and again, we see Jesus actively working against the norms of patriarchy. And so as he traveled from town to town, Luke tells us that a group of women traveled with him. And to our modern ears, this doesn't sound astounding in any way, but in Jesus' day, this was shocking for women to travel with a group of non-male relatives was considered scandalous. 
To include women as his disciples was unheard of in the ancient world. So let me give you a story that many of you will know well. In Luke chapter 10, we, we hear the story of Jesus visiting one of his favorite sibling groups. You know them as Mary, Martha, Martha and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother. And as he spent time in their home, Martha was busy preparing the meal so that everyone had something to eat. And while she was preparing the meal, Mary and her brother Lazarus were with the rest of the disciples because Jesus was teaching and training them. And at one point, Mary went to Jesus to complain. She wanted Jesus to tell her sister Mary to join her in preparing the meal. Now, culturally, Mar uh, Martha's frustration extended being uh, beyond being left to do all the work on her own. We all know what that feels like. I'm working hard, everyone's relaxing. Why doesn't someone else help? That's not what Martha was frustrated about. She was upset because Mary had placed herself among the disciples. She was upset because Mary was acting like she belonged with the men. And Jesus responded to Martha saying, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Jesus was defending Mary's desire to be a disciple, and his response indicates that there was more than enough room for Martha to join too, if she so chose. In this morning's text, we have a list of women named Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and they join the likes of these fishermen and tax collectors to form Jesus' followers. Jesus, like the farmer of verse 5, wasn't afraid to scatter seed in unlikely places. A few years ago, I was standing in line at Vancouver Airport, ready to board a flight to Toronto. I was standing there with a good friend of mine. The two of us were working on one of our denominational national committees that were congregating in Toronto. And as we stood in line waiting to show our passport and our ticket, we were talking together about Jesus. Now, I don't remember exactly what it was we were saying, but we were talking about Jesus. We got our passport and ticket verified. We passed through the little check-in, and we started to make our way down the, the, the jetway to get onto the plane. As we were walking down the jetway, a woman approached us from behind, tapped us on the shoulder, and said, I couldn't help but overhear what you were saying about Jesus. Thank you so much for being an encouragement to my faith. We got on the plane, we took our bags, put it in the overhead compartment, we found our seats, and once again, in that four and a half hour plane ride, we talked about all kinds of things, but, but preeminent in the conversation, we were talking about Jesus. When we landed in at Pearson Airport in Toronto, we grabbed our bags, we exited the airplane, we're making our way back up the jetway, and another person came up and tapped us on the shoulder and said, I was sitting be behind you the entire trip to Toronto, and I heard what you were saying about Jesus. You have challenged my thinking, and I realize that I need to think more seriously about him was later on that night when I was in my whole home hotel room that I thought to myself, I wonder who else was listening. A good farmer knows the quality of their soil. They know where to plant seeds. We are not like those farmers. Not when it comes to planting the seed of God's word. We don't know what's going on in our colleague or our family member or neighbor or classmate's heart. And so, like the farmer of verse 5 and 12. Everywhere we go, we scatter the seed. We talk about Jesus indiscriminately, everywhere, with everyone who knows where a seed might be planted that bears fruit. In verses 6 and 13, Jesus addresses the second kind of soil, the second kind of heart, and I'm going to refer to it as the fragile heart. These are people who initially embrace the news of Jesus with great joy, but like a plant without roots, they fall away when things in life become difficult for them. So my wife and I moved to North Vancouver in 2006. And when we moved into uh, our home, a home that we still share with my wife's parents, 
We were greeted by two towering trees in the backyard. There was this massive hemlock tree and a mighty Douglas fir. And in those first two winters, I began to learn an important difference between these two kinds of trees. The, the Douglas fir has roots that drill down deep into the soil, while the hemlock's roots spread out in every direction just a few inches below the surface. And so you know what it's like on the North Shore during the winter. There's a lot of rain, and sometimes there's a lot of wind, and you see the, tr the trees swaying back and forth dangerously. In our backyard, this is exactly what happened, and the roots of the, of the Douglas fir kept it anchored, and it stayed fast, but the hemlock was another story. It began to sway so dangerously, we called in a tree expert, and the tree expert said, this tree is not going to hold. And so either you cut the tree down or it's going to come crashing down on your heart. I want to suggest to you that some people, followers of Jesus, are like Douglas firs. And other people are like hemlocks. And my question for you is, when it comes to your life in Christ, how deep do your roots go? Some people are only interested in Jesus for what they can get out of him. Now, to be fair, we're all interested in Jesus for what we can get out of him because he has what we need. He has love and forgiveness and wisdom and strength. But the difference between a hemlock heart and a Douglas heart comes down to the roots. How deep they go and whether we want what Jesus offers without any cost. I suspect all of you here in the room with, with the, the, in the room with me would agree when I say that we live in a pleasure-oriented society. Is that, is that fair to say? It's a pleasure-oriented society. And so the anthem that is often unspoken is, if it doesn't feel good, how could it possibly be good for me? And so we want our medicine to taste like bubble gum. We want to lose weight without diet or exercise. We want to succeed without difficulty. We want transformation without effort. But anything worth doing requires hard work. A university degree, a career, marriage, friendship, all of it requires hard work. We live here in the West in a democracy, and so we're not accustomed to anyone telling us what to do. Think about even our government. We elect our government. And if we don't like what they do, then we get rid of them and we vote in others who are more to our liking. This is what one pastor writes. Our culture is based upon a rejection of the divine right of kings, but for the Christian, God remains on his throne. The idea that God would interrupt our agenda, our will, and seemingly trample upon our rights by asking us to do something, anything, is deeply troubling to the contemporary person. Following Jesus is costly. Brothers and sisters, it will cost you everything. It will cost you your independence. You cannot live for yourself and live for Christ. You can try, and it might appear that you're growing for a while, but in, in the time of testing, your heart your commitment will be revealed for what it actually is. Fragile, at best. In verses 7 and 14, Jesus speaks about the third kind of soil or heart, the thorn-infested heart. These are people who begin to follow Jesus, but as they go on their way, life's worries and riches and pleasures choke them out, and they don't mature. So Jesus uses this vivid image of a seed planted among thorns. And this is an image that if you live here on the North Shore, or really anywhere in the Lower Mainland, you have seen this play out all the time, often with blackberry bushes, right? So a thorn, what, thorn bush, what it does is it chokes out a plant's ability to grow. It doesn't happen all at once. It happens over time. Often a seed or a plant and the thorns grow up together and it's hard to tell where one starts and the other ends. But slowly but surely, the thorns begin to act like a boa constrictor and they squeeze out life, making growth nearly impossible. 
plants need room to grow, and so to the human heart. Jesus worries that uh, Jesus warns that things like worries and riches and pleasures function like thorn bushes in our lives. What they do is it crowds out God's life and priorities. And before we know it, we're entangled and we're gasping for spiritual breath. Instead, Jesus is inviting us into a life of fruitfulness. And fruitfulness requires a kind of single-mindedness. And to maybe help explain this, I, I want to offer uh, an illustration. So my parents, pre, uh, the, the, their genetics predetermined that I would never become a basketball superstar, right? I mean, just, I mean, look at me. I'm way too short. My, my wingspan is way too small. I've always loved the game of basketball. My size meant that, that I, I, I didn't play very competitively, but I've always been a huge fan. And when I was growing up in high school, there was no bigger name in the NBA than Michael Jordan. So you're, you're going to see on the screen behind me here a poster featuring a Mike, uh, Michael Jordan, and, and the title is Wings, and it, it's meant to impress us with the size of Michael Jordan's wingspan. So just, just by comparison, if you were to take a measuring tape from fingertip to fingertip, my wingspan reads at five feet, eight inches long. By comparison, Michael Jordan's wingspan is six feet, 11 and a half inches long. It's incredible. LeBron James, his wingspan is a little bit over seven feet, close to seven one. The longest recorded wingspan of any professional basketball player in history right now is eight feet one inch long. Isn't that amazing? But here's the thing. No matter how wide a person's wingspan, we can stretch so far and no further. So I want you to imagine with me that when you said yes to following Jesus, it's like he took you by the hand, and the two of you began to walk the path step by step. But over time, as you walked with Jesus, you began to see things around you just off of the path, bright, shiny things that you wanted to be included in your life. It could be almost anything. Maybe it's a more popular group of friends. Maybe it's a better job, more education, wealth power, influence, it could be almost everything. But as you hold on to Jesus and you see these things around you, you begin to reach. And reaching for these things is straining your relationship with Jesus. Remember, we all have a wingspan. It stretches so far, but no further. And more often than not, if we want the things off the path, the only way to get them is to let go of Jesus himself. So, here's the question for all of you this morning, are you clinging to Jesus and keeping in step with him? Or are you reaching for things that are straining your connection to Jesus? Let's turn our attention to the fourth part. In verses 8 and 15, Jesus spoke about the fruitful heart. We read that the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, they produce a crop. One of the great privileges that I've had being a pastor for 25 years is getting to spend time with people as they near the end of their life, whether because of age or because of illness. And so frequently, I've thought to myself, when I get to the end of my life and to the years that I've lived with God and for God, what's going to stand out as being particularly important or meaningful? A few years ago, my dad was over on a Sunday afternoon, and we were talking about the things that we consider to be really important in life and how those things change over time. And my dad said, Mark, in nearly every conversation I have these days, do you want to know what subject never comes up anymore? And I said, Dad, I let me know what subject never comes up as you're talking with people. And his answer was work. My dad is in his late 70s, approaching 80. He, he said, Mark, I worked a profession for close to 50 years. And no one wants to talk to me about what I did during those 50 years. Instead, they want to talk to me about my family, about my friendships, about faith, 
the kinds of things that really matter most. And that conversation with my dad got me thinking about the importance I place on transient things. I mean, I wonder, in my last moments on earth, as I'm laying in a bed somewhere, is anyone going to be asking me how many churches I pastored? Or how large and influential my churches were? Or what kind of a car I drove? Or how big my bank account was? Or where I went on vacation? How do we evaluate whether we're living well or poorly before we get to those final moments? I want to suggest that in this parable, Jesus gives us something of a target. We're meant to hear his word, grab a hold of it with two hands, and by persevering, our lives will bear fruit that point to the glory and the goodness of Jesus. Every single one of you here today are living a life that has been marked by God. All of you have experiences and skills and talents and passions, each of which make you a gift from God to others. And gifts, as we all know, are meant to be given. Your life is meant to be given to God and to others for his purposes in this world. Apart from God himself, there is only one other thing that will last for all eternity people. And the question is, are you investing in people? These days, people talk a lot about legacy, and it's, it kind of bothers me, because the things they mention are, are, are things about wanting people to think well of them, or think that they were important after they're gone. None of that matters. I believe with all my heart that the things that are most important in life, the things that we leave behind live on in the people that we loved and pointed towards Jesus. Because in the end, everything else just fades away. Everything else. This morning, God is present in our midst. God is present to love us. He's present to forgive us, to heal us, to shake up our lives to reveal our false attachments so that we can surrender them and be more fully His. It's Jesus' presence among us by His Holy Spirit that makes the fruitfulness we read about in Luke 8 possible. And so this morning I want to ask you a question or two. You're not meant to answer out loud. But if you were to invite Jesus to transform one part of your heart today, what would you ask him to transform? Or if you were to ask Jesus to come by his Holy Spirit and to remove a barrier or a kind of thorn that's choking out life, what would you ask him to remove? Or if you were to ask Jesus to give you a gift today that would make all the difference, what would you ask him to give? I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come and join me. They're going to lead us in a concluding song. As they come, allow me to pray for you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you today for your word. The scriptures describe your word, God, as being like a double-edged sword that can penetrate past our defenses, that can get to the heart of the matter and expose. And Jesus, we thank you that your word always does this. It reveals what's on the inside, and it gives us the opportunity to surrender once again to your love and transforming power. So Lord, today I'm, I'm with your people, your children, whom you love. And I pray even now that you would search your hearts and that you would name and reveal the things that they need to let go of in order to be more fully captured by you. We believe you are a God of power. As Pastor Press said, you don't just care, you're capable 
So we pray that you would come in your strength and you would transform, that you would remove barriers, that you would give us good gifts, including the gift of your Holy Spirit's presence, that we might walk hand in hand with Jesus. And so today we choose to trust you. We choose to listen and to follow. And we pray that you would make us fruitful. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.